In this lecture, I'll build off of our previous discussions on militarization as well as terrorism and discuss war and violent conflict as well as weapons of mass destruction. I'll first start with a discussion of the extent of war as well as a overview of weapons of mass destruction. From there, I'll move into a specific focus on nuclear weapons, drawing from MASCO's 2008 piece, Survival is Your Business, Engineering Ruins and Effect in Nuclear America, which addresses a number of considerations concerning militarization and preparation for war, particularly emotional preparation for war in the population of the United States. A lot of this revolved around avoiding internal dissent. Operation Q was a key part of this, following off of earlier tests in the Nevada desert in Operation Teapot. I'll also address some more of the contemporary representations of nuclear weapons in particular, as well as discuss um, the representations of destruction of New York City and Hollywood and media. So if we look globally at the incidents of war and violent conflict, or the absence thereof, you can see this figure here from the Institute for Economics and Peace, where you have the state of peace uh, in a variety of countries throughout the world, uh, with state of peace in, for example, Canada and Australia being very high, as well as European countries. Seven of the top ten most peaceful countries uh, on the planet are, in fact, uh, in Europe. The uh, Institute for Economics and Peace maintains that 500 million people are living in countries that are at risk of becoming less peaceful uh, overall. Uh, Another way to think about this is some other uh, statistics here in terms of conflict and political violence in 2014. You can see the extreme risk here uh, of countries uh, listed uh, over here, the top 10 in terms of uh, war, violent conflict, political violence uh, overall. If you look at the number of deaths, and these is uh, 2002 figures, number of war deaths in 2002. Uh, you can see a, a disproportionate representation uh, in Africa uh, followed by uh, Asia. So what are weapons of mass destruction? There are a couple of uh, different ways to conceptualize these. At the level of the United Nations, these can include nuclear, biological, chemical, as well as missile technologies that uh, are uh, essentially delivery systems for these weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs has a, a website which is available on Bolt, and it, it highlights the uh, various weapons of mass destruction, as well as the treaties that consider uh, these weapons and how they should or should not be used, or how they should be dealt with and managed overall. Uh, first, the uh, in terms of nuclear weapons, which will be the main focus of this particular discussion today, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons in 1970, and the still-in-process Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Uh, there are resources available on Bolt with links to maps that document those that are in support of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in terms of by, by state, by nation state, as well as a overview of the atomic uh, weapons testing or hydrogen uh, bomb testings. Uh, and these were extensive throughout the United States and indeed in Operation Teapot in Nevada you see many soldiers that were uh, exposed to what turned out to be quite detrimental, even lethal doses of radiation. Um, and this, these were essentially human subjects. This was essentially human subjects testing the blast radius, and you can see them uh, after this blast walking into uh, the actual area uh, afterwards, going towards uh, the blast. And again, that link is available uh, on YouTube and through Bolt. In terms of biological weapons, there is the Convention on the Prohibition of the development, production, and stockpiling of bacteriological or biological and toxin weapons uh, and on their destruction. This was uh, put into force in 1975, as well as the Geneva Protocol in 1925. Uh, the United Nations Office of, uh, for Disarmament Affairs continues on on their webpage and they talk about chemical uh, weapons of mass destruction. The 1997 Convention on the Prohibition 
of the development, production, stockpiling, and use of chemical weapons and on their destruction. Uh, the Geneva Protocol 1925 also me mentions chemical in addition to biological weapons. In terms of missiles, there's the Hague Code of Conduct on, against Ballistic missile, missile Proliferation in 2002 and the Missile Technology Control Regime of 1987. Uh, again, these missiles are uh, potential delivery systems for weapons of mass destruction. Um, here you can see a figure from around 1960 of the U.S. Honest John missile warhead uh, that shows uh, sarin, uh, sarin uh, bomblets. Of course, this is a chemical weapon. In the United States, uh, there is a more inclusive definition of weapons of mass destruction. This is covered under uh, the Criminal Code, Title 18, uh, Part 1, uh, Chapter 13B, Subsection 22332A, Use of Weapons of Mass Destruction. And in this, they define weapons of mass destruction as any destructive device as defined under Section 921 of this title, and I'll get to that in just a second. Any weapon that is designed or intended to cause death or serious bodily injury through the release, dissemination, or impact of toxic or poisonous chemicals or their precursors, any weapon involving a biological agent, toxin, or vector, as those um, defined in subsection uh, section 178 of this title, or any weapon that is designed to release radiation or radioactivity at a dangerous uh, level to human life. So section 921 is where I think it gets a little interesting here in terms of defining uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it seems like a very inclusive de definition uh, under section 921, title 14. Destructive device meaning any explosive, incendiary, or poison gas, including a bomb, grenade, rocket, uh, missile, a mine, or similar uh, device. So we might think about how um, the contemporary use of uh, munitions in war and how uh, many uh, uh, objects, many uh, what m some might consider to be conventional weapons uh, would in fact be under U.S. law, under the U.S. criminal law at least, would be considered uh, under the U.S. code, would be considered to be weapons of mass destruction. I'm going to transition a little bit here and talk about uh, nuclear weapons in particular, and uh, of course a lot of the conversation starts here with the um, use of nuclear weapons on civilian populations, uh, and it's the only uh, wartime use of um, nuclear weapons. There's a lot of discussion about the, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, Hiroshima, uh, the little boy, the so-called little boy uh, bomb, and in Nagasaki, the fat man in um, August 6, 1945, and August 9, 1945, respectively. And uh, Masco talks about this in his article, uh, Survival is Your Business, and he addresses the images that were available for general uh, public consumption. And these often involved aerial displays of uh, the bombs, of the, of the blasts themselves. Um, from there, um, also the destruction uh, of the city from a really broad perspective, not really giving uh, too much sense of the actual suffering that's embodied there. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, Enola Gay uh, in its mission um, in the bombing. So we have uh, these images, which widely circulate. In contrast to these images, however, we see other images which do not necessarily see um, so much the, the light of day. These uh, ground images and um, these are, if you go ahead and do searches, uh, Google images, you can see images that are um, very uh, descriptive of human suffering. Uh, I semi-edited these in uh, my selection of these here. Um, the images include uh, both children and infants uh, in uh, various uh, states of suffering uh, from uh, nuclear uh, or radioactivity as well as the blast as a whole. Um, so you can see firestorms here um, suffering in terms of skin impacts, uh, potential death, and uh, widespread dest destruction on a real uh, personal level. There's a more of a human scale, I think, when you look at um, these blasts uh, on the ground um, after the impacts overall. So Masco in his 2008 piece, Survival is Your Business, Engineering Runes in Effect in Nuclear America, 
discusses Operation Q, which is one of several tests that takes place in the Nevada desert. Um, it follows in the legacy of Operation Teapot, and this was a project of the Federal Civil Defense Administration. And the intent here was in 1955 to create a, this is where the media were essentially invited out to the nuclear test sites. And so this became a way to encourage the public to become informed of the potential for nuclear uh, attack, uh, as well as to prepare themselves uh, for nuclear attack and in that feel some uh, sort of safety overall. And so Masco describes this as an international slash national theater where this weird, fantastic city um, and the effects of the bomb on every aspect of middle class white suburban life are examined. And so there is participation of about 150 industrial associations um, that come in that donate materials, that set these materials up in the Nevada test site. The uh, bomb is detonated and the impacts on um, things like clothing, for example, are, are looked at. Uh, for example, you can see one of the mannequins here, one of the J.C. Penney uh, mannequins dressed in J.C. Penney duds, and they uh, essentially circulate around. They make a tour of the United States. Uh, essentially, you can survive the uh, nuclear apocalypse uh, and uh, supposedly get on to work the next day in your, um, in your suit, in your dress, um, so forth. Uh, the Federal Civil Defense Administration looks at creating a bomb-proof society, and they're concerned with documenting the potential impacts of nuclear war. And again, it's all about adequate preparation here. The uh, FCDA... Um, re-releases the film, the 1955 film in 1964, um, and they note in the very beginning that the weapons are very much more powerful, in fact 600 times more powerful than they were in 1955, so the blast radius would essentially, um, where the bomb was detonated, would essentially uh, annihilate a lot of uh, this weird, fantastic city uh, in the desert itself. Uh, this becomes part of the overall educational campaign of uh, the Federal um, Civil Defense Administration and the United States government. And the idea here is that, you know, survival is your business. Preparing individuals uh, both for survival at the level of businesses, uh, at the level of personal shelters, and even in schools there are the duck and cover exercises, which we see, of course, uh, today uh, more in the context of uh, shooter incidences in schools and shooter preparation incidents in schools. And so all of this is about the production of a society that is prepared uh, essentially for a nuclear attack and nuclear war. And this has to do, Masco argues, with the emotional management of citizens because there was a real concern that without a very deliberate attempt to emotionally manage U.S. citizens, that both race and class would class, uh, class lines would essentially ignite with a, an attack. There would be chaos in the cities uh, if American citizens weren't adequately prepared for this. And this uh, was Project East River in 1952. Uh, in fact, the new color coding system adopted by TSA was first proposed by Project East River uh, in the 1950s.